those online that are visiting on our Wednesday night service, hello, may God bless you, and hope you be blessed by this message. We're going to go to Ezra chapter 3, and the title of my message is, from a Yogi Berra quote, it ain't over till it's over. It's a long time ago, but he has a lot of good one-liners. If you ever get around Yogi Berra, look it up on Google, he has some good one-liners. And this is one of his most famous, it ain't over till it's over. So before I read Ezra chapter 3, starting in verse 10, I do have to kind of say this. We sometimes get in the habit, and I, I, I can get in the habit of just reading the word and not really be moved by the situation or the moment that's happening. Sometimes it's easy to check it off. I've read it a thousand times. That It is what it is. And like, oh, that's cool. And underline it and circle and go, cool. Have you guys ever done that before? Like, ah, and you forget. Like, these are real people. This is a real situation that happened. And this moment is very real to them. And they encountered a very real God. Amen? So when I read in Ezra, this is in verse 10, we're going to start with this. And just in verse 10 alone is pretty powerful. Once you know the backstory, which we'll get to. When the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow the trumpets, and the Levites, descendants of Asaph, clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord. Just as King David had prescribed with praise and thanks, they sang the song to the Lord. He is so good, he has faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders had seen the first temple wept wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. The joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that that could be heard in a far distance. So, this is pretty exciting. I don't know what's, like, if you really know what the background of this situation, this is pretty exciting for them. So to kind of get a little background, we're going to go to 2 Chronicles 36. They kind of summarize it pretty well. So I'm going to read just a little bit, so just bear with me. So the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them. The Babylonians killed Judah's young men, even chasing chasing after them into the temple. They had no pity on the people, killing both young men and young women, the old and the infirm. God handed handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. The king took home to the Babylonian all the articles, large and small, used in the temple of God, and the treasures from both the Lord's temple, from the palace of the king and his officials. Then his army burned the temple of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all the palaces, and completely destroyed everything of value. The few who survived were taken as exiles to Babylon, and they became servants to the king and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. So, there's a lot I just read. But here it is. This is where we got to put our imagination caps on. Because these, as once again, these people lived this, this is their reality. So when that foundation was laid, this is a promise from God from 70 years that they waited to happen. Everything was torn down. And when you're reading this scripture, yes, the young that were born in exile, this is an exciting time for them. They're like, yes, we're out of exile. This is a praiseworthy moment. They heard from their family members, like, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And they're excited about this moment. But there's a reason why the older ones that were taken into exile were weeping. And I don't think it was just a complete sadness, but I also feel like there was some joy of weep, like a, a joyful weeping. But also this moment, they saw family members die. I just read they lost loved ones. They came in and killed their mothers, their dads, their grandpas, their grandmas, their kids. Think about this moment. They lost loved ones in this. They saw the temple literally just get torn to pieces and their country destroyed. They are joyful. They're like sitting there going, what is just happening? This is a, have you ever had a promise come through and you're sitting there going, you don't even know what emotion to feel? This is a big moment, and sometimes we just read it and go, I did my Bible reading for today. This is a celebratory, like if they read it again, going, that was awesome. They're moved by this. But I begin to think about just other people in the Bible, as I'm reading this story, that kind of went through some things, that had their 2 Chronicles 36 moment. And you may have had one, and I know other people may have had, but like, think about Job, right? 
The man was the most righteous man at the time. And he literally had everything taken away from him. He was left with three crazy friends and a wife that told him to curse God and die. He lost his kids. He lost his wealth. And he ended up with one of the worst things you can almost have is boils. Like he was in a lot of pain scraping these things off. He went through some stuff. I think about in Matthew 8, the leper in Matthew 8. At one time, he had everything just going right for him. He probably had, was married, probably had kids, had a career. He ends up getting leprosy. And back then, they literally just, you'd lost everything. They took everything away from you. And you were an outcast where kids would throw rocks at you and make fun of you. And you had to wear a bell around your ankle and then let people know that you're unclean and not worthy to be near. Can you imagine that? Then I think on a lesser scale, I think of Elijah. He had this great moment in Kings where he takes on 850 uh, of the prophets and he destroy, him and God rock it, right? It's one of my favorite stories. They do an awesome miracle on those, those, that time. Then you go to the next chapter. A queen wants to take his life and he gets overwhelmed by a moment and gets into depression. He even tells God, I am no better than the other prophets before me. Just take my life. He goes into complete depression and darkness. And then I think about Peter, right? His second Chronicles 36 moment, where he's literally hanging out with Jesus, who he says is the son of God, and his friend, and he ends up denying him in front of everyone else. And in Luke, the, the, Luke writes this. He says he ran away and wept bitterly. He was overcome by a moment. He thought he was no good. Have you ever just failed God and you sit there going, I am no good anymore? Then more of today in not biblical terms, I think of, and I think about two other people. I think about, I'm a sports fan, so I'm going to use a sports analogy. I'm around sports a lot. Is Peyton Manning. He was one of the greatest, he is still one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever throw the pigskin. But there was a time where he was a great, and then he ended up having neck infusion sur surgery. Where he says in an interview, he couldn't even grip a ball. And he was loved and adored by his city and fans and his, by his his owners, but once he couldn't grip a ball, they treated him like nothing and kicked him out and said, we're going to cut you. It was a dark moment for him where he dumped something he loved so much he couldn't do anymore. Then I just think about myself. I'll use myself as an example. I literally just went through my, I'm still not completely out of my Second Chronicles 36 moment. But as I sat in a hospital bed and reading the thing, like, I may lose my life we will probably have to take off your arm. I thought for a moment, I just picked up photography. Like, I could still preach without an arm. I could still teach. I could still minister. I could still do this job. But one thing that has given me solace and kind of, have you ever just had that thing where you just like to get away and just brings you peace? I picked up photography. My company was booming. Things were happening. And I just got booked to do a lot of, a lot of shoots and a lot of sports shoots. And I had to call all of them and said, I don't know if I can do it anymore. And that's, I just wept. It was a sad time. But this is what I love about God. It ain't over till it's over, right? We have to get excited about that. Until you take your last breath, it ain't over until it's over. God does have the final say. And there are Ezra 3 moments that do happen. I think about this Ezra 3 and the Israelites. They literally went from 2 Chronicles 36 to Ezra 3, and there is celebration happening, and they're seeing the foundation laid. In Job, you see chapter 42 happen in their life. It's one of the most beautiful things that are happening in Job's life. There are still scars. He's weeping because he got everything a hundredfold back, but also he still had to bury kids. And he still had to be reminded that he still lost loved ones. Loved one, the kids that he loved very dearly. But he got everything restored. I'm sure he had scars from boils on his body that always remind him of what he just went through. I think of Elijah and how God continued to minister to him. And eventually, I bet you, when he got back up and got on his journey, I bet you he had moments. I hike a lot and I hike by myself many times, and I have moments where I just think about the goodness of God, and some of the times I sit there going, man, I've gone through a lot. And I bet you he sat there and went, whoa, I can't believe we're doing this again. Think of Peter, John 21, right? This dude went back to fishing. He thought it was done. 
And God said, Jesus didn't pull him aside. You are a dummy. That was stupid. Shouldn't have done that. I told you. He literally puts him around. He goes, hey, go feed my sheep. And he restores them. We still have a mission. Let's get up and let's go. I think about Peyton Manning. He eventually got signed by the Broncos. A lot of those who watch football, like he ended up in his second year here, he had one of the best seasons a quarterback can ever have. That hasn't even come close yet. Like he put up numbers that are not seen today. And I guarantee, and he calls himself a man of God, a man of faith and a man of God. And he has these moments when you see those interviews about his faith. It's pretty deep. It's different than a lot of people. It's not this outspoken one. It's a very quiet, private faith he has. But I guarantee when he st- stood on that field for the first time, he probably went, I can't believe I'm here. And my Ezra 3 moment was literally when I got to pick up the camera again. I went through a lot to get there, and I stood on that field getting ready to take photos, and I just started crying that I went on my knees. I was joyous, but I was also, man, I've been through a lot. Came out of nowhere. Because it ain't over until it's over, right? And we must remember, there are two things I want you guys to remember when you go through these moments, if you're in your Second Chronicles 36 moment is this is one thing I had to keep on, and this is very cliche, but I had to focus on who God is. I had to get my horse blinders on in a race, and I had to keep reminding myself who God is, and I had to fill my, my life with faith because I could have lost my life. I could, all these things had happened, but I had to stick close to God. I think of, of Job. He didn't curse God and die. You think of these people, they, I bet you these ones in exile were sitting there going, yes, we got to steady the faith. we got to keep focused on God. Peter probably said, oh, I hope I get a second chance. <laughs> I bet you he sat there. Have you ever sat there with God? I hope you give me another chance. I don't want to screw it up again, right? And we sit here going, you look at, you sit here going, man, I want to have my Ezra 3 moments. But you got to keep your eyes focused on God. And the next thing I will tell you, you have to do your part. There is a part you play in this. There are some times where God just miraculously does everything, all the fighting for you and just does everything. We read it in scripture. But most of the time, there's a part you have to play. And in all these situations I just said, there's a part everyone had to play. The Israelites eventually had to get up and leave exile. They had to continue to believe in the promise, right? They could have stayed. They could have said, ah, false, that ain't going to really work. They had to eventually do it. They had to get there. They had to lay the foundation. If you continue to read Ezra, there's a lot of things they had to go through and a lot of opposition to get to where they're at. Think of Job, right? He stayed the faith. He kept after it. He kept looking. Can you imagine what he went through and sitting there going, yeah, God is good. He praised him when everything was good and he praised him when everything was bad. And he even says it in Job chapter 2. Should I just praise him when I only get blessings? And not praise him for when I get the cursings. And he stayed the faith. And he kept at it. He is a great example. I think of Elijah. He had to get up eventually. I've been in dark depression before. I've had suicidal thoughts. I've gone through that world before. And I'm telling you. If God is meeting you in that place, there is a point you have to play where you have to believe it and get up. It's something we have to do. Elijah had to get up. Peter eventually had to believe, go feed my sheep, and he had to eventually show up to the upper room. There's an action he had to take that he knew he was forgiven and set free, and he had to do something about it. He could have went back to fishing and said, "Eh, God just doesn't, it's, yeah, that's cool, but I'm not worthy. And he had to believe it. He had to take a step. He had to make an action where he said, yes, I am free and I'm forgiven. I'm going to show up in the upper room and we're going to see what happens. And the rest we read is literally amazing and just full of beautiful. We're here because of this. I think of just, I'm going to put Peyton Manning guy in the same spot. The rehab that I'm sure he had to go through. I never had neck infusion surgery. But I've had blood clot surgery and arm-saving surgery and heart 
I've had all those surgeries. But the rehab you have to go through, I'm gonna, this is putting it lightly, is hell. I'll never forget the one moment when I first went to rehab. They told me, they gave me a two pound dumbbell and said, curl it. And I literally stood like this. And I started crying in the middle of a rehab place. <laughs> and I felt so embarrassed and shamed. I said, I can't do it. She goes, I'll give you a one pound bell. And I was like, oh, let's just make it worse. And I couldn't even lift that. But yesterday, I just did 27 pounds 10 times. I sit here because there's points I'm just like, and I still go through a lot. I have a finger that literally turns white. I have no feeling in it. I can literally hit against things and it'll just like hard as a rock. Or I'm like going to the doctor and let's just amputate this thing. I don't need it. I've been trying to take pictures with my middle finger going just in case I lose it. Might as well learn how to do something. But we have these moments where we have to go through some hard stuff to get to Ezra 3. We have to be patient. We have to persevere. We have to literally live by the fruits of the Spirit. And they're just not something you quote. There's sometimes you need the Holy Spirit to do some supernatural things in you. And you got to stay steadfast in the faith and do what you got to do to get to Ezra 3. Because it ain't over till it's over. And we have all had those moments. And some of you have never really had like this crazy Second Chronicles 36. I hope you never do. But if you do, keep your eyes on God and do your part. Amen? Amen. 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 That's what I have. I will pray us out. And then there's still some Chick-fil-A up front. So, Father, we just thank you for your goodness and grace. I just pray for those that are just, they're going through it. I pray they just stay steadfast in the faith and keep going forward. They keep their eyes on you. And if there's a part they need to play in it, you show them clearly the part they need to take and their role into the story. We just thank you for just, once again, your goodness. Help us keep our heads straight and our hearts focused on you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen.